Well, Mike, would you come up and just introduce the Dry Heat Band, the members? So we'd like to know who everybody is. We're glad you're here helping to worship with us today. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Uh, we are so blessed to get to be here. We love absolutely traveling to churches and being a part of their worship <laughs> service. The guy playing the big doghouse bass is what we call him. He's a great guy, sings a good song, and really a great musician. We're Happy to have him with us, Mr. Ken Killebrew, right here. Back in 2016, uh, we were needing a banjo player, and we got two for the price of one. Uh, we were introduced to this gentleman. He's a uh, music professor, born and raised in Nebraska, then uh, headed north into the Wyoming area. Wyoming State University taught music. His parents had retired down here in this area and uh, he would come down to visit and decided when he retired he'd make his way down here along with his wife Mary. Great musician, we'd love to have him. His name is Dave Brinkman. Make him welcome please. As I said earlier, we're so blessed. Been together 19 years. Lots of music uh, people kind of come and go or have trouble kind of staying together but we've been uh, busy for 19 years, started in 2000, and uh, Tony and I uh, were kind of like brothers. I think I know Tony uh, better than my, my own brothers and family because we spend so much time together, but he and I founded the Dry Heat Band at that time, and here we are 19 years later, plays a fine ukulele, a great singer. My friend and partner, Mr. Tony Miller. <laughs> my name is Mike Blackburn. We are blessed. Thank you very much for being here today. Yep. Well, Cowboy Joe was uh, was back with uh, at the bunkhouse with the rest of the cowboys. He'd gone to the big city to uh, go visit the big city church. So he was telling his his buddies about that trip to the big city church, and and he said, "Well, you know, when I pulled in, they they had me park my old truck back in the corral." And Charlie interrupted him and said, you mean in the parking lot? Yeah, yeah. So he said, I got out of my truck and walked up the trail to the door. He said, you, Charlie said, you mean the sidewalk to the door? He said, okay. So Charlie, or Joe said, well, I, I went in the door and I, I met this dude inside. Charlie rolled his eyes and said, that's the usher. Well, yeah, the usher, he took me down the chute. Charlie said, he took you down the aisle. Well, he took me down and, and had me sit in this stall. Charlie said, pew, it's a pew. Yeah, said Joe. That's what that pretty lady said when I sat down next to her. Oh, we're talking cowboys today. And no, I'm not talking the Dallas Cowboys. I heard the other day that the, the Dallas Cowboys are being moved to the History Channel. I probably made a few enemies on that one, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, as we turn to the Word, I pray you would speak through your Word to us, Lord. Open our hearts to hear what you need us to hear today. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, I didn't grow up on a ranch, but I did grow up in Flagstaff. And, and there were ranches all around Flagstaff. Every weekend, it was kind of the same thing, you know, those dirt dusted, dirt road dusted pickup trucks would be rolling into town, enough dents and dings in them that you knew these were working trucks, these weren't show trucks. The back window of most of them, there was an old 3030s hanging in the window, and, and most of them had a Ford badge on the front of the, of the grill, and uh, I got to know a lot of the the uh, cowboys over the years, the Babbitt brothers and some of the cowboys that worked for them and uh, the McCabe's who would come into town and, 
some of the other cowboys, uh, they're all authentic cowboys. I mean, these were the real deal. Bunch of white guys, bunch of uh, uh, Native Americans, bunch of Mexicans, but they were all the same when you met them out there on the range or they'd come into town. Authentic, real people. And most cowboys are kind of like that. They're authentic, they're real. Slow to speak, quick to act when needed, attentive to their animals and livestock, and they care for the land that they're working on. Out of the ranks of some of those bow-legged uh, writers have come gifted artists who depict the life here in the West with, uh, you know, things, scenes like the, the mountains in the background with the, the cattle drives and depicting the pain of, of bronc riding and then depicting the fun of, of some of the, the events at the rodeo like mutton busting. If you don't know what mutton busting is, you need to look it up. And poets in the style of Will Rogers uh, tell it like it is with a little bit of dry and sarcastic humor thrown in for fun. Terry Nash, R.P. Smith, men like uh, Chris Isaacs will keep you laughing at life. Most of the cowboys I've met are pretty humble people. They're just real down to earth. They most often have a deep faith in God, even if they don't go to church regularly. They're often thankful to be alive, having enough water and food and clothes to wear, just thankful and know that they are blessed. To the simple wisdom of knowing that you don't give the devil a ride because he always wants the reins. And knowing that if you don't want to stumble, you better be on your knees pretty regularly. Psalm 121, so important for us. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Whether work in the range or the office, it's mighty easy to start thinking that what you're doing, nobody else can do as good as you do that you're pretty darn essential in life. And then I look up at the mountains and I get a reorientation. And I remember I'm not such a big shot. I'm pretty insignificant. Maybe I'm not really much more than a speck of dust in the universe, you know? If it weren't for God, I'd be slipping and sliding through the muck of the barnyard without any direction at all. And then I get down to verse 8 and I read, The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. See, we make a big mistake in life. We often mistake humility for inferiority. We make that mistake and we think we're inferior. We think we're worthless and unimportant, unnecessary in life. And it often happens when you retire. That line of thinking, though, is a hopeless line of thinking. It's, it's hopelessness. But the other part of that is that's Satan laying his lies on you. He's laying the big if on you. If you were only good enough, that wouldn't happen to you. If you only had more faith, if you were only strong enough, if. It's a lie, isn't it? It's a lie. It's the same why he said to Eve, you will not surely die, for your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. See, we fall prey to those lies, don't we? We listen too much to those recordings instead of listening to God. In the physical realm of the universe, we may be just another insignificant speck of dust which somehow has mysteriously come to life and can think and reason, but therein lies the critical difference and the significance for you and I 
because you are significant. You've been created in the image and the very likeness of God. You mirror his creativity, his love, his compassion, his mercy. Hmm. Unless you give up the reins to the great liar. Matthew 4 recounts Jesus' time in the wilderness, separated from his friends, from his support group that you all have here. He experienced temptation, just as you and I do. And Jesus challenged Satan. He said, I don't live by bread alone, but by every and by the very word of God and every word of God that comes out of his mouth. You see, Satan wants your worship. And he's willing to do whatever it takes to get it, to lie to you, to tell you, to plant the big if in you, to get your worship. Who do you choose to spend your time, energy, and your worship with? Well, after Jesus returned from the wilderness, he said about his ministry, and part of that ministry was to choose disciples, those who would follow him and learn from him and become the people to spread the good news of Christ. And so he went across along the shore of Galilee. We read about that in Matthew 4. Well, Arizona doesn't have much in the way of seashore. So if it was today, we might be reading something like this. Jesus was walking by the corral, and he saw James and John saddling their horses. And Jesus said to them, come and ride with me. I'm going to teach you how to round up men and women, because the kingdom of God is at hand. You see, here's the deal. God is alive. Jesus is real. He lived. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead. He's worthy of your time and energy and your worship. You matter to God. You are made in his image, and what happens to you matters to God. He's called you good. Living authentically for God means following Jesus, rounding up others who haven't yet heard this good news of Christ, that we're forgiven, that we're loved, that we can have eternal life. We live in a dry and dusty desert, don't we? And it's not just dry and dusty physically, it's dry and dusty spiritually. You know, in the Southwest, There are fewer people that go to church here than most nearly anywhere else in the world. Did you hear those numbers about Brazil? I I don't know if you heard that. They said the first night there were a thousand people that came back to learn how to be a disciple and how to teach others. And they ran out of buses, so they got more buses. And it wasn't enough, and they got more buses. And it's still not enough. They're hungry to hear about the good news of Jesus. What's wrong with us? Why aren't people around us hungry to know about Christ? I think they are, but they don't know. They haven't had anybody tell them yet. God is depending on you just as he did with James and John and Peter and Timothy and Ruth and Phoebe and Priscilla and Mary Magdalene to live authentically, real for him. You know, people ask me about Lakeview and and I tell them all the great things that you're doing and how wonderful you are. And then I tell them, but you know, we're not perfect. God's still got a ways to go with us. Thanks be to God, he's at work in us, amen? Always keeping our eyes on the hills. Always keeping our eyes on Christ. Oh, we're going to trip and stumble once in a while, but we're learning, we're getting there. You know, if we do that, if we keep our eyes on Christ, if we keep, stay focused on him and we keep our eyes on the, on the hills, then God is going to lead us and guide us and, 
and people are going to see you and are going to wonder, why are you so full of joy in this mixed up, messed up world that we live in? And you're going to spur others on to know about Christ's love. Jesus came out of the country from humble places because you need to know he's real. You know, people said of of Nazareth, what good could come out of Nazareth? Just the Savior of the world. A lot of good came out of Nazareth, out of humble beginnings. He's not plastic. He's not some politician that's telling you what you want to hear. He's telling you the truth. That you're in need of Christ's love and grace and forgiveness. Lift up your eyes to the hills. Where does your help come from? Your help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He won't let your foot slip from his presence, for he watches over you. He never sleeps. He's at your right hand in the morning, and he protects you from this harsh world. The Lord watches over your coming and going, both now and and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Thanks be to God for that.